In the spring of 2020, our lives shifted in a way unimaginable with the onset of the COVID pandemic. The arts community was among the most affected by the shutdown, isolating artists from audiences, colleagues, and opportunities to sell their work in traditional ways. But Ingenuity won, and many artists found new ways to connect and also share their work. Our local community of Cape Inn met the challenge by taking advantage of the new media formats that offered a platform to artists for sharing their artistic journey and work. This took the form of Cape Ann Art Waves, a bi-weekly video program that captured the essence of this uncertain time in our local art scene, continuing beyond the pandemic through January of 2023. As co-creators, co-hosts, co-producers, Christine Fisher and Jacqueline Genham DeFalco, also both artists, are proud to present the highlights of the 75 interviews that capture this critical moment in history and the rich stories of the artists gallerists, and curators from across the spectrum. We are honored to share this compendium of highlights to broaden the reach of these artists and continue our rich heritage as an arts destination. Many thanks to the Cape Ann Museum for becoming the official steward of these stories for future generations and to the Cape Ann Savings Bank for the financial support to create this video. We hope the videos will enhance the effort to brand Cape Ann as a vibrant, forward-looking arts community, building on its rich heritage for generations to come. Hi everyone, I'm Jacqueline Ganim DeFalco, and I'm here to introduce a new show that is going to be hosted by 1620 through three studios, and we're calling this Art Waves. The purpose of this show is to showcase individual artists and arts organizations and let us know what's happening behind the scenes, um, what their inspirations are, and of course, uh, learn more about the people that are on the show. I'm very proud to be co-hosting this with Christine Fisher, who is a, a fantastic artist in her own right. Uh, but also known here in the community uh, for her work in leading the arts community and also uh, in other communities such as uh, Marblehead where she was the executive director. And uh, Christine had a long corporate career but now she's really dedicated uh, to uh, a new path in the arts. So we really welcome Christine. And yeah. our inter Thank you Jackie. And we have some uh, fantastic representatives of the arts community with us today. We have Joanne Crawford, who's actually been running the Sea Arts organization now for a long time. I don't know if Joanne has an exact number of years, but she's very involved um, in uh, bringing Sea Arts forward, and as well as many other things here in the community. She's a wonderful representative on all fronts. And we have Lauren Doucette who's relatively new, is the head of the uh, Rocky Neck Art Colony, but again, a phenomenal artist in her own right. We're in the midst of uh, a time that we've never experienced any of us before. Um, and so groups like the Arts had to instantly start to think differently about the organization. Joanne, what can you tell us about the way that Sea Arts is thinking these days? Well, I'm obviously, uh, the first thing that, that came about was our weekly e-blast had to change mm -hmm. completely because um, suddenly we were coming up with lists of everything that was canceled, mm -hmm. which is not the kind of e-blast that anyone wants to get. So mm -hmm. um, so I, I just basically switched the whole um, genre, the whole way that we do business to instead of every everyone knows that everything's canceled so <laughs> we went with that and then we did um uh, similar to what lauren's been working on at rocky neck we um, put together resources for artists so. and this is a real opportunity to build community in a very different kind of way so i think uh, maybe lauren you could take a stab at um at talking about if you're thinking differently about the arts community? Hmm. I think that we've just made a greater 
it's just a real strong reach out to our membership. Mm-hmm. You know, what do you need? How can we support mm-hmm. you? How can we, um, how can we challenge you to keep going with your art? Mm-hmm. So we've been doing, so we've been just actively reaching out to the membership in a really strong way. Um, weekly on our newsletter with weekly art challenges. Mm. And so in place of our weekly drawing class that was really thriving, Mm -hmm. we do weekly art challenges. Okay. And they're different each week and we post all the the entries on our website. A lot of people are very, very anxious right now. Mm. Well, you know, I would have to say, just speaking from from my for myself, I also have been running with a fair amount of anxiety and I have found Mm -hmm. my own practice to be very healing you know I, I don't know if i'm making good art bad art questionable art i think it's all over the spectrum but it feels really good and it's it's my way of providing some structure to my day and it's just mm-hmm. very healing for me it's really a you know a coping mechanism for years i was a painter and uh, i painted until that just didn't do it for me anymore and I mm-hmm. kind of took inspiration from what my life was at that point. We were rehabbing an old house, and I learned to shingle and to lay mortar and do all sorts of things. And it felt good. It felt good to build things. So I do a lot of that. In fact, this thing that I just showed you. Yes. After I was done with it, with my digital processing tools, uh, I entered it in uh, the Rockport Art Association's uh, national show. Yes. Which was, uh, you know, in all over the country, people entered. There were wow. seven, about 700 entries for that show. Mm-hmm. Of, I think 160 were accepted. Mm-hmm. And the piece that started with this was it was juried in the show. It made me feel pretty good. Oh, as, as you should. Yeah. Net, net, I think you have a, an image of the finished piece. That's it's, right. It's called Untitled 068B. <laughs> I loved it. It's just full of mystery and it's just dreamy. The colors are dreamy. Thanks. And I, and I printed it on Hanamula watercolor paper. Ah, okay. It it without glass or acrylic in front of it because the texture of the paper is so beautiful. Uh, My work, as you said, is uh, quite contemporary, very colorful. Uh, I try to make it very wearable. It may be um, movable, kinetic, um, but it's fun and playful. (laughs) Yeah. um, You bet. (laughs) And fun to wear. And very joyful. I mean, I've said that to you before, but that's always the descriptor that I have when I think about your work. (laughs) Oh, thank you. Okay. So uh, I'm doing a lot of a lot with animal um, themes and w- wildlife themes. Mostly, um, what attracts me to it is is the motion of of the you know the life in the animals is really what I love to capture. And I I've, I've had a lot of fun um, just kind of relating the way the metal bends and curves and and comparing that to the you know the shapes that I see in in the animals and for me it just matches right up very easily so you know I, I've enjoyed doing a lot of um, living characters you know and then recently I started doing some more contemporary stuff I've had a lot of fun with glass and and mixing different mediums and and that's kind of pulled me in another direction but I gotta say, most of the things that I do seem to have a spirit in them, and and that's that's really what attracts me to this work. You know, with the work I design, I think it's it's about you know clean lines, nice designs, simple palette, minimal. A lot of it sort of pulls back to references mid-century modern work in a way, mm-hmm. um, and you know everything that I develop is sort of careful thoughtful and um, again again very minimal in, in terms of what we do so I might uh, a finished piece might go through you know dozens of iterations before it actually gets to the final shape mm. I think I look at my design work and I compartmentalize that in one respect as you know and that's again as I, I, I play take on that role as a designer I'm trying to work within the context of, of that existing field 
push beyond it a little bit and pull in a lot of my influences that uh, I think derive from my work as a fine artist and a sculptor and bring those into the work that I make. One of the things that we did when, so it was around March 10th, I think, the NBA canceled the season and we thought, whoa, this is serious. <laughs> and so that's when I realized, you know, people probably aren't going to be coming into this gallery anytime soon. And we sort of thought, we could actually live and take over any space we want in the house. And so we took the front gallery and we rearranged it with some of our favorite artists. Mm -hmm. um, and then this painting up here, I'll just show you. So this was something I painted probably in 2003. Oh. And that's Bobby in our Granite, um, Granite Street apartment at his desk. And that's, um, that's Jack Sabbath. And um, you're not supposed to say <laughs> So we sort of gave him, this is the center of our front gallery. So he's our, he's our anchor. There's an Aber Sparrow version somewhere around here too. But one of the things, see, I'm a self-taught artist. And one of the, re the way I taught myself how to paint was I'd be on a painting and I'd do some kind of flourish and it would remind me of an older painting and I'd go and find it and bring it out. Mm. What did I do then? Oh. And, and that's how I progressed. And so when we came here, all of my older paintings or ones that we cherish and keep were sort of stored away. So we've just, you know, unpacked for the first right. time. His writings have come down and they've just been um, so prescient, you know, okay. in, in time. Jill's paintings right now too, you know, they're so imbued with meaning and relevancy for the moment. Is it, yeah. Look at her a little bit as an apocalyptic painter to some extent the way she yeah. plays with you know, her color palette and, and subject matter and, and this is like a spiritual side to her painting. Right. Like what would be one word to say, this is, this is how I would distinguish my work. A large, and a large scale colorist, I would say. Okay. That's I really love color and um, I like working on a large scale. And your work is fun. I can see some of it behind you. Uh, you. Really fun and it's, it's upbeat, you know. When I was in fashion school, um, I realized that what I really loved about clothing was character, design, um, history, things like that, the real nitty gritty of real life. Um, I, I started doing the koi I, when I was in business as a headhunter. We had a convention in Maui and I first saw the koi there and I thought, oh my God, this is just moving color and water. This is fantastic. I took a bunch of pictures. I knew someday if I ever started painting again, I would, which I planned to do, I would probably do those, which I did. And I am still doing. I've been doing them for a very long time. And, um, and then I started in 2000, 13, I think it was, I started looking at my palette and I thought, boy, there's some interesting stuff happening here mm. that I'm not even aware of. It's very subconscious. Right. So maybe I can see how to put that on the campus. And that's where the abstractions were born. I think about myself as a maker and I always have. Mm -hmm. Since I was a kid, I like to make things. I tried, I taught myself jewelry making and silversmithing. I'd take a class, get books mm -hmm. and just do it. And um, over the years, I just developed an interest in beautifying my home. I think that's what my inspiration is, making my surroundings nice. And that started the patio. Ah, excellent. You know, excellent. and I had to make a little mosaic for the center. And I thought, oh, that was, that was really, it suited me because I like tools. I like to make things and I liked the art component. I worked with Timothy Timothy Hawksworth, who, who was here mm -hmm. as part of the Get Him In residency, artist residency program in Rocky Neck, which is a fabulous residency program. Right. And that really transformed my thinking around my painting. And it became obvious that I was giving up so quickly on paintings and thinking, oh, this this one is terrible. I'm just, I was working on this very big painting right from the day one. And at first I loved it. And then as time went on and I was working on it, I started hating it. And I started, and then for the next couple of days, I was saying to Timothy, you know what? I think I'm just gonna tear it down because it was taking up the whole wall mm -hmm. and start from scratch. So he very calmly suggested 
well, don't make any rash decisions yet. Just hang in, move on to something else and then go back, whatever. And I did, and it wound up that that piece was really transforming for me because it almost felt autobiographical because yeah. there were so many layers to it and it wound up that I loved it. So that whole process was a real learning experience for me to, to let go of, of judging at any given point whether your painting is good or not mm. and just let that go and, and let the process take care of itself. It really takes a lot of courage too, right? I mean, it, it is. Does. It, you have to just have faith in the process. Exactly. It opened my eyes. I never looked at anything the same again. It was always with the thoughts of how can I, how can I paint this? Mm. And I appreciated everything so much more by, from, from painting. Um, so I look at the world differently and when I go in to paint, I just go into this trance and it's sometimes it's hard to get out. Like you don't, once you're in that trance and you have to come up and make lunch or whatever, it's, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, it's a shock. <laughs> so it's, it's, um, it's quite, uh, physical experience painting. It's affected my whole life. That's amazing, Kathy. It sounds to me like a little bit of a meditation almost, you know, it when is. you focus on it that way. That's a beautiful thought. Thank you for sharing that. I think people will really, uh, that will speak to a lot of people that are listening to this. So I did a lot of um, research, not just with talking to the people, but also, you know, reading Joe, uh, Joe Garland and reading, um, uh, Mark Kurlansky and um, and spending some time at the library and at the um, Cape Ann Museum. Um, so there's a lot of um, sort of famous historical figures. The first one that I had to put in was um, Howard Blackburn, of course, because that's just such a crazy story and it's so Gloucester. Right. Um, uh, but. Um, uh, so, so reading all that informed me as well and sort of gave me a little bit of a um, place to stand. Um, there's also poetry in each of the mm -hmm. panels. So I have, the first one is um, uh, Vincent Perini. The second one was um, Charles Olson, um, then T.S. Eliot. And then the fourth one is my dad who was a poet. So I, I put him yeah. in. <laughs> um, and um, so, uh, trying to get a Gloucester from lots of different angles. A fair amount of time up in northern Thailand, northern um, uh, Nepal, actually. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it just, I, I look back at the pictures and I realize that I just took pictures of people's everyday life and tried to <laughs> capture that. Things that I found very different than the way we lived. I tried to, you know, capture the, you know, the, the boats and the, the, the markets, that type of thing. Well, you're a cultural photographer, really. Yeah, and just the, and then to learn the history of those places, I was yeah. always interested. Mm -hmm. Is representing the world that I live in. So I'm, I'm living in this environment, I'm seeing buildings, I'm seeing streets, I'm seeing telephone poles. Uh, you know, when you combine that sentiment Mm -hmm. of, of having some type of a feeling. It's not that I'm going to try to describe what it is because it's kind of indescribable. Mm -hmm. And you combine that with the visual things that you learn. You learn about color, you learn about shapes, mm -hmm. you learn about line, uh, those abstract things. So when you combine the sentimental part of it, the feeling of a place where you live and combine that, you have to combine it with the visual elements mm -hmm. because you're actually doing a picture. And at the end of the day, it's it's a visual right. form of communication. So to me, the communication, I think of communication, communicating on those two levels mm -hmm. in terms of there is a sentiment and people feel that, as you said, it's some charming thing or something. Um, there's a sentimental aspect to it, a feeling aspect to it. So let's uh, put up uh, a rye number five. 
Okay. That's, that is going to be in our show. Talk to us about that piece. And, you know, this is a, a really good um, point to talk about kind of what you're, what you were reacting to when you were making it. Mm -hmm. This is definitely a pandemic piece. I, I, uh, I made quite a lot of work during the pandemic. Um, I was lucky. A lot of uh, my artist friends I know, um, couldn't work. They were just blocked right. during this right. time. But I happened to um, use the time and, and it was um, a, a good way for me to escape all the terrible things on the news. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. This piece is definitely, uh, it's a mixed media uh, made with uh, spray paint, house paint, um, copper tape um, on paper, and it's all applied to boards. Wow. Um, and it's called a rye, a, a series of seven paintings. Um, because, and you'll notice all lines, well, on this one and this, all, all of the paintings in the series, they're all off a little bit. Nothing, none of the lines are straight. Um, just it show, it's, was my feeling about how things just aren't right mm -hmm. in the world. I consider myself a contemporary artist. I did definitely have my roots in abstract expressionism because okay. uh, I painted uh, my feelings, my thoughts, my ideas, all that stuff. And uh, over the years, I actually developed some personal symbols uh, that I really enjoy, like I might tuck in a little uh, window to the universe someplace, or if mm -hmm. some uh, an undecided kind of topic, mm -hmm. I might do some game squares in there. Um, I also paint not objectively. I'd love to just take the paintbrush and start painting on the canvas and focusing on color and composition, and that's really enough. You know, it's very satisfying. Um, I don't don't look for more if that's the kind of mood I'm in. Mm. Uh, basically, I'd say um, I'm pretty comfortable um, playing with various styles and different departure points because we live in a time that's got such varied, rich influences in, in, in all, all, you know, aspects of culture, and it all becomes part of your vocabulary. Yeah, what you do with it is that's individually, that's what you know, makes the difference, I think. Well, what I'd like to show right now are your beautiful paintings titled Voyage um, that do tie back to, I believe, your last trip to Italy. Yes. Right? So if you could kindly talk to that for us, I think they're just stunning, Nella. Thank you. Um, it's again, the because uh, when something moves you, you also imprint it in your mind, this imagery. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not necessarily the perfect rendering of something, but it's just the essence of what you're seeing and what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. It's a very difficult thing, so you have to let it happen organically in a very uh, natural way. Mm -hmm. So when I came back to um, came back home here, those feelings were still part of me the light that you find coming from the south and traveling north by car on the autostrada and really savoring the landscape. Because nothing's harder than being given your chance. And so, mm -hmm. and, and you know, I was fortunate in that I do have this chance to, to explore it's something that I feel that is really in my bones. It all revolved around gesture, mm -hmm. finding the the simplest gesture, the strongest gesture within the form, and it kind of took me away from sculpture and into drawing. My, my father, again, was a painter, and he, he was very much into figurative work, and I somehow inherited that, uh, that passion as well for drawing figures and painting figures. And so initially, it was, I, would, I would always be sketching uh, just on paper figures at the beach, uh, in very kind of energetic ways and over time got more deeply into the oil painting. Uh, I would always be doing watercolors as well, which are nice quick studies at the beach. And, uh, you know, initially things were, you know, my style was kind of tight, a common thing, and then I loosened up as time went on. And uh, really in the early 2000s, uh, kind of made, made a leap into 
I think the beginning of my of my current style. That piece, um, it was just made this summer. Yes. Um, in I did it. I sold it recently, so it lives in a beautiful home somewhere now. <laughs> but what I realized was that I realized that I had to leave my position at Rocky Neck and pursue my dream of always of being a full time artist, art mentor, and teacher. And immediately when I made that decision, I started making that painting. And it was a full investment and celebration of everything I love about painting, mm -hmm. about color, mm -hmm. flowers, mm -hmm. and my favorite artist, Odilon Redon. Sometimes I like work by other people and I, you know, I sort of experiment and try to go in that direction and it just, it doesn't work. Like, you know, you can only paint your own voice and abstract work is sort of what is your feeling at the time or what comes through and you know that so that has to come from you mm -hmm. and um yeah so i think i'm really influenced by my surroundings i you know it's my work is not um it doesn't show like landscape but it definitely has an atmosphere to it um, and some of them have a lot of energy to them. It's very expressive um, movement in the paintings. Vincent's Cove, I've done a number of images of that. Yes. Um, large black and white woodcuts, color woodcuts. The idea of the mythology of this cove, which once existed in the heart of downtown Gloucester, the mystery of it, and the fact that it was so lively in its day, not very long ago, the turn of the century. I think it was filled in, in large part, uh, 1917, 1918. But it's the, it, it, it epitomized what Gloucester was, you know, anchor works and shipbuilding, free shipbuilding yards, and the whole uh, cramped in quality of it. And, and uh, it's just the idea that it's buried and interned under Rogers Street. Yeah. So fascinates me from a point of view of history. Again, a lighting specialist, and I think that, uh, as I mentioned, I, I, I view lighting as being, you know, 99% of the job. You know, anybody can go out and buy a high-resolution camera, but if you don't know how to light a, a product properly or a subject properly, all you end up with are these really huge files of garbage. So you can, yeah, everybody can load up a hard drive, but you know, are they usable pictures? In a lot of cases, no, they're not. And this is what I run into with a lot of the uh, industrial stuff I do with a lot of the jewelry photography. <laughs> I know <laughs> that, that I do is, and it's probably no tougher product to photograph than jewelry. Really, it's certainly right up there. And 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 again, lighting is critical. And I'm a professional engineer as well. So I mean, I'm, I I kind of balanced working as an engineer and and an, an artist, which. A lot of people said, "How can you do both?" And and um, basically, the way the way I approach engineering is solving problems, thinking outside the box, more creatively. And the way I attack my art is very methodical and almost uh, like an engineer would to solve problems. That's that's kind of the way I work, which is a little strange, but that's how both that's sides of the brain. <laughs> there might be like some pieces that stick in my mind and eventually come up. Um, there's one picture attached uh, from a castle and a gate that's uh, from my hometown in the Czech Republic. And actually, I was back home a couple of weeks ago um, and uh, I um, just realized the gate was closed and I've seen the gate like for, I don't know, that I remember like for 45 years. <laughs> and it's actually, finally, I realized it looks like a butterfly. I mean, when it comes to art, like you said earlier, we, you know, it makes us into problem solvers. And um, I think that's my favorite part. You know, if I'm ever too comfortable in my work, I'm uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to continue to push boundaries and grow. Yeah. And see what's possible. My uh, woodblock printing and my uh, watercolor painting is very detail oriented. Um, it is more exacting uh, because it has to be. Uh, 
than my painting style, which is uh, usually very, my oil painting and acrylic painting, which is usually much more um, uh, emotional and uh, big picture rather than detail oriented. I think we want to go on and we want to talk about your gallery here on Pleasant Street, the mm -hmm. Jane Deering Gallery, mm -hmm. which is such a gem. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about your mission behind this gallery. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, I did think that um, after showing work for so many years, right up to 2015 in the Anasquam House and the Shed, yeah. that I should uh, find a space that had a greater visibility for the public and a wider range of public mm -hmm. um, and found that magical spot. Mm -hmm. on Pleasant Street with that great big window and um, the sun pouring in. So the mission there continued on with the mission in Anaskan to show local artists. Mm -hmm. I, you know, artists, and you're included in this, don't like that word local artist. Mm -hmm. It just narrows them down. So maybe regional artists, but I did want to show art by those who were doing very strong creative work on Cape Ann. So that's, that's part of the mission, definitely. Um, the other part is to bring in art from other areas. And as you mentioned, I have, I know quite a number of artists in California and I have brought their work into the gallery and mixed them together. And artists from overseas and brought them into the mix as well. And um, so that's also part of the mission. Thank you to the thousands of viewers who have enjoyed Cape Ann Art Wave since its inception. In March of 2020 on Channel 12, 1623 Studios Media and YouTube, Art Waves can now be found in the digital library of the Cape Ann Museum, housed on Vimeo. Episodes will be available by year. Each video includes a list of artists interviewed in that calendar year. A very special thanks to our amazing sponsors, videographer Anders Johnson, musicians Steve Lacey and Pat Verga, graphic designer Linda Stockman, the team at 1623, and Sea Arts colleagues who supported this program since the beginning.